If we're still uh, thinking about uh, the many, many things that are involved in discipleship, which is a lifelong process of following and becoming more and more and more and more and more and more like Jesus. Sermon topic the past uh, couple of weeks has been this, living according to our kind. And this morning, again, one, one more message about this because I think it's so essential that we understand two main passages of Scripture we'll look at. They're going to be up here on PowerPoint, but if you want to look at your uh, Scriptures as well. I just want to remind you from the last couple of weeks, God created us to live according to our kind. If you remember back in the book of Genesis, as He created all things, He said, this is good. And it was so... But when it came time to create man, the Scripture says, the Lord God said, let us create man in our image, in our likeness. In other words, according to our kind. And the Bible says that man was created from the dust of the ground and God breathed into him the breath of life. In other words, God breathed into mankind something different than all the rest of creation. And that was Himself. God breathed Himself into us. His DNA, His nature was placed inside of mankind because He wants us, as with all other parts of creation, He wants us to live according to our kind. Which is, in fact... His kind. And that's pretty cool. God created us to live according to our kind so we could relate to Him and to each other since we're all created to live according to His way of doing things. Uh, starting off here in, in Matthew uh, chapter 22. It says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, where do we get that name? Why, why were they called Sadducees? They were sad. They were sad, okay. Pretty good. Why were they sad? They didn't believe in the resurrection. So that would make them very sad, you see. See what we did there? With, with that, okay, yeah. When hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And who were the Pharisees? They were the religious leaders of the day. They were the ones that tried to hold everybody accountable to every little dot and cross T of the law. And they, they were just so brutal and so judgmental and so hateful sometimes. And, and they just were not fair, you see. So that helps you remember the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Jesus had silenced the Sadducees. The Pharisees then got together. One of them, who was an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. He's actually quoting from Deuteronomy when he said that. The second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. For all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You suppose they were a little surprised because he didn't go back to the Big Ten? Which is, which is the most important commandment? You got ten. Pick one, Jesus. Phone a friend. Is this your final answer? Jesus said, you know what? The whole thing summarized right here. But just for fun, let's go back to Exodus 20. Let's look at the top ten. And we'll see how Jesus took the top ten and brought it down to two. Okay, and these are the listing of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20. God spoke all these words. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. And you shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Number one. Number two, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses His name. Remember when uh, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And He says, when you pray, pray like this, Our Father who art in heaven. Then what do you say? How holy is your name. God says, my name's holy. Don't you misuse my name. Well, and then here's the third one. He says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. What a great thing to understand God planned rest. For those of us that are workaholics, some burn their candles on both ends, some just throw their candle in the microwave and nuke that puppy. Just think we got to go, 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 go. God planned rest. But then he also says this, Shifting gears just a little bit. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And that made sense because we read further in the law that if you disrespect your parents and are bad, they had the right according to the law to take you out and had you stoned. We'll rock you to sleep for a good long nap. So... It made sense if you honor your parents, you'll live a long life. If you dishonor them, they have the right to take you out and make another one just like you. <laughs> you shall not murder. Hmm. Do you suppose that also includes abortion? Full term? Yeah, God said, don't you kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to to your neighbor. So we see that of the top ten, the big C's, the first four deal with man's relationship to God. The other six deal with man's relationship with his fellow man. If we love God, not like chocolate chip cookies or not like your buddy or your spouse, but if we're going to Strive to love God with this unconditional agape from the depths of my being. If we're going to love God, we're going to keep those first four. And if we're really, really, really going to try to love our fellow man the way Jesus did, the way we're taught to, then we're going to keep the other six. So I have to ask this morning... As we begin the message, how are we doing? How are we doing on these? Time for a little self-exam this morning. So let's pray before we jump into this. Father God, I thank you for the truth of your word. Your word is living and active. It is to be applied to our lives. James encourages us not to be hearers alone, but that we need to do what it says. And so... 
I pray, Father, that you find us faithful in trying to do what you've commanded us to do. We praise you and thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. Lord God, thank you for being a patient Father. Help us to not take that for granted. Holy Spirit, work on us, work in us. Teach us to love like Jesus. It's in His name I pray. Amen. Have you found this true in life that sometimes church people can be just so dogmatic and so legalistic? Uh, uh, one of my mentors is actually a Church of Christ preacher. And, uh, and he says that Church of Christ people can be, can be so guilty of the get it right syndrome. And he says, now, I don't agree with all my brothers many of which think we're the only ones that are going to be saved. <laughs> he said, I think the Lord has opened my eyes a little bit to understand that He has grace and some of the rest of you sinners are going to go to heaven too. Of course, we sit there going, mm, okay, thanks, Jeff. But he says, church people can be so ugly sometimes. Get it right! I was watching a little deal of Mark Lowry the other day and it was, I thought it was kind of cute. He was talking about how the Lord had opened his eyes to see that there were more than just Baptists going to heaven. And he said, you know, we used to just preach at you sinners all the time, but then I realized God's grace has let some of you in. Yeah. <laughs> he said, some of you have been divorced. You could never be a pastor in a Baptist church, but God will let you in His kingdom. And all these people are kind of giggling. I'm sitting there going, thank God for His grace. Yeah. I know of some that have studied the Word so intently and they can preach it so clearly and without question, which is good, but I sense that in many cases we poured so much into our heads and poured very little into our hearts. And our hearts have got to be a whole lot bigger than our heads. Would you agree? Love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love's a verb. Love is an action word. It's also emotion. And so that should tell us that God wants emotion as well as motion. He wants us to love, but we got to do something with it. We can't just sit back on our blessed assurance and say, love you. Praying for you. James writes very, very practical. He says, if you see somebody in need and you don't do anything for them, what good does that do? Amen. Oh, we love you. We're praying for you. Thank you. I'm drowning. We'll pray somebody comes along and throws you a rope. You're here right now. Jump in and help me. Nothing should excite us more than worshiping the God we serve. Many of us grew up singing some of those great old hymns. My Jesus, I love thee. Remember that one? Okay. More love to thee. Oh, how I love Jesus. And we're commanded to love God with everything we've got. There's been times that I've, I've, I've heard people stand and sing yet as... And, and not trying to be judgmental, but as fruit inspectors looking into their lives, it's almost as though we're singing, Some to Jesus I surrender, some to Him I reluctantly give. I'll surrender some. Is that how that goes? No. We're admonished to give Him our all. But the truth is, church, God's never going to let us get by with just loving Him. We've got to relate with each other. We've got to love each other as well. He created us to live according to our kind so we could also relate with others that are supposed to be living in that, that same way, which is according to 
his kind. I ran across a story in my reading, I thought it was kind of cute. There, there was a seminary student who, uh, while college was dating a young lady, started dating a young lady, and uh, boy, he just really wanted to impress her about how religious of a guy he was, and so every time they went to do something, I mean, even if they just went to the library to study together, or if they went to get a, a soda, or somewhere else, or what, he would always pray with her before they went, kind of gave him an opportunity to hold her hand, you know, you pick up on that real quick at Bible college and seminary. You know, let, let's pray. You know, that, way. that way you could hold her hand. Always with quoting scripture. He felt a very strong need to have a scriptural basis for everything he did. Well, they dated for a number of weeks. And he really wanted to kiss her. But he couldn't find a scriptural proof text to support his feelings. And so finally after dating for several weeks, frustrated as she was, waiting on him to make his move and realizing, I don't think this guy's going to do what I'm hoping that he would do, she finally just decided to grab him and she looked at him right in the eyes and said, Luke 6.31! And then kissed him right square on the mouth. And he was just in shock. What do you think about that, huh? Oh, look at you. Look at you over here trying to look up the verse. Oh, my goodness. I haven't seen Bibles turn that fast in a long time. <laughs> trying to beat me to the punchline. Some of you seem surprised. Don't know. You don't know what Luke 6.31 says? It says, do to others as you would have to <laughs> do to you. Right? So it's like, come on, Clyde, if you're not going to get her done, I'll, I'll help you out here a little bit. Well, let me ask this. Do we really do for others the way we wish somebody would do for us? Or do we often sit back and say, you know, I should probably call them. I should probably go by. I should probably do this. I should probably do that. Do we really do for and do to others as we wish others would do for us? Or are we just playing games? Would the Lord Jesus really treat other people the way we do all the time? Think about some situations that you've been in that were maybe not the most pleasant of situations. Did you literally treat that other person the way you think Jesus would have? Man, I'm cutting my throat here. I had an encounter with somebody yesterday afternoon and the person was obviously in a really, really, really bad mood. And, and I, I'm ashamed to say it, but I, I said, man, I can tell you're in a bad mood. But then later I got to thinking, how wrong was I? I should have been able to say, can I pray for you? Don't know what's going on, but I, I sense that today's a hard day. And I missed an opportunity. Because Jesus is God in the flesh. I know Jesus could look at her and go, boy, you're in a bad mood. And I'm, I'm trying to be like him, but that, that was as far as I got. And I really missed an opportunity. Would God be proud of the way we treat other people all the time? Man. Maybe you're thinking, I should have skipped a day too. <laughs> I counted up real quick about 25 people that aren't here. 
for, for various reasons. And I've told you before, you know, they, they, they teach us preacher school. You write a sermon that you need, maybe somebody else can benefit from it. So, in our daily relationships, do we ever really actually stop and think, what would Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus handle this? Remember, God, it hadn't been that long ago that this was a, a popular little thing. And so I'm thinking, maybe we just need to pull some of that back up and, and re-look re at some of these things. What would Jesus do in these situations? And again, in my reading, I, I ran across this, and I thought, this, this is worth sharing. So many sermons on love. So you can go home today and say, man, he, he preached and preached and preached and preached and preached. I think there were several sermons all in one. Well, there are. I'm going to throw these out real quick. Look at this. Put up with others instead of putting them down. Isn't that good? There's a, there's a T word that comes in there that sometimes we just need to tolerate. Put up with others instead of putting them down. The next one, give strokes, not pokes. Yeah, I could, that, that could, that's a good one. When others rub you the wrong way, don't let them rub it in or rub you out. Maybe you have a, a family member or a co-worker or a neighbor that loves to sit down at the controls and start pushing your buttons. They know which ones to flip. They know just what to say. And, and, and they'll get comfortable in their little seat. It's a gaming seat. And they get in there and they just ready to mess with you. Know anybody like that? Well, if there's somebody in your life that tends to rub you the wrong way, don't, don't let them rub it in. Don't let them rub you out. And I love this next one. Treat other people the way you want them to become. Isn't that good? Treat other people the way you want them to become. I didn't put this one up there, but I know you've seen it. Act the way, you, uh, act the way your dog thinks you really are. Oh, yeah. Something like that. And, and this one has been around forever. Count down before you blast off. My uh, maternal granddad was such a patient man, but I remember even as a child, times watching him that I think <laughs> he was literally counting down. Because I would see him go. <sighs> and I think he was just <laughs> counting down before he might blast off. All of these are good. This last one, though, it starts getting a little more difficult. And James, again, here he, he comes up again. One of the most practical letters in the entire New Testament. James, Jesus' little brother, says, Control your tongue. It's small, but it's powerful. And he gives a couple of examples. Like the rudder on a ship, though it's small, it directs this massive ship. And bits put in the mouth of a horse. I mean, just tug this way or that way, you direct the horse. Anybody besides me, your, your mouth gets you in trouble sometimes. Uh, my wrestling coach in high school uh, had a little saying. Uh, and I'll change it just a tiny little bit. But he would uh, come up to us, usually from behind, and would reach around and put his hand over our mouth and pinch our nose. Okay? And if you had not learned to breathe through your ears yet, that became uncomfortable while Coach Kyle talked to you. But he would say, Now Bartlett, son! Which was always hard for me because Coach Kyle was in my parents' Sunday school class. <laughs> and I'm like, oh! 
but he would say, confused us, get that, confused us, used to say, don't let your mouth get you in trouble. Control your tongue. Think about this for just a moment. Would you say that word with me? Gossip. Gossip. Again, gossip. One author shares this. Gossip, it topples governments, wrecks marriages, ruins careers, destroys reputations, causes heartaches, nightmares, indigestion. It spawns suspicion and generates grief. It makes innocent people cry in their pillows. Even its name hisses. Gossip. It makes headlines and headaches. So before you repeat any story, ask yourself, is this going to hurt anyone? Is this even necessary to repeat? Is this any of my business? Well, if not, the author suggests, I invite you to pray with me. Dear Lord, please help me keep my big mouth shut. And oh my goodness, being a minister for over 40 years, I have hmm, and, and even being the target of so much stuff. I've, I've almost every church I've been a part of, we've had good people that would call up and say, well, I'm, I'm going to have some prayer time and I just thought I might ask you what actually is, is going on with Betty today. We missed her in church. Well, first of all, is that any of your business? Did you call Betty and ask her why she's not here? Actually, today's Betty's birthday, and she's spending time with family, and so I want you, when you call her, say, Miss your church, happy birthday, gal, love you. Have you ever known those people that, for prayer purposes, are trying to pump you for information? Yeah, I've had a couple of good church secretaries that were really gifted in that way. Gossip. And then with the list of things, I had another one. <laughs> and, and it's this. Admit when you goof. Admit when you goof. And last night... Looking over this again, I realized I goofed. I forgot to type that in on the PowerPoint thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it should be up above the scripture. It says, admit when you goof. Hey, we all make mistakes. We all have room for improvement. But here's a neat passage from Jeremiah 18. Check this out. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house. There I'll give you my message. And so I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot that he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as it seemed best to him. What would be the message? I think the message would be, we can be in his hands. And still be marred. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? We can call ourselves a Christ follower. We can be a good Christ follower. We can be a faithful, devoted servant of God and still have problems in our life. Does that make you sense? Sure. Jesus told his followers, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. He has not given us a clean pass on anything. We can even be right in the middle of God's will and still have struggles. But God can and will reshape us. Isn't that good news? Oh, man. 
He's not a throwaway God. Anyone and everyone is salvageable. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. Any of us. And those of us that have been through that, that terrible garbage of divorce, we've had others look down on us and judge us and say, you are not worthy. And, and we can go around and feel like we've been branded with a big D on our forehead. One of the greatest promises and things that I see in Scripture, in this Jeremiah 3, I believe, God's divorced. A couple of you are going, hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Israel was unfaithful, so he divorced her. God knows what it feels like to go through all that. Praise God. I have this in my files. It was written by a pastor named Ed Town. He was a minister of the Pantana Christian Church in Tucson, Arizona. And he wrote this. And unfortunately, just a few weeks after he wrote it, he died in a very tragic automobile accident. But this prayer, and I'm going to share it with you up here, expresses the great need for us to use our lives to build each other up, not to tear down. To encourage one another not to destroy. And to look for the good in others, not the bad. As I look at this, I, I say, Lord, this should be my prayer. And maybe you would think this too. Sorry, the type's a little small, but... He says, Lord, I offer myself to you in this new year. Not just part of me, but all of me. Here are my eyes. Help me see the good in others. To focus on Jesus above all else. To weep over the hurts and the lostness of people. Here are my ears. Use them to hear the cries of hurting, lonely, oppressed, and discouraged people. And help me to hear your still, small voice in whatever you want me to do and be. Here's my nose. Use it to sniff out the good, not the bad. The positive, not the negative. Here's my mouth. Use it to speak only your words. No slander, backbiting, criticism, or tearing down. Only words that build up. Here are my hands. Use them to reach out and touch. To do deeds of kindness. To extend a pat on the back, not a slap in the face. Here are my arms. Use them to lift up the fallen, to share a hug or encouragement and comfort to anyone at any time. Here are my legs and feet. Use them to go wherever you want me to go, to stand firm when all else seems shaky, to walk in your ways no matter how hard that may seem. And here's my back. Use it to bear the burdens of others and to carry the share of my share of the load. Here's my mind. Use it to dream, plan, and think on whatever is excellent and worthy of praise. Help me to set it fully on things above, not on earthly things. Here's my heart. Use it to love as Christ loved, to serve as Christ served, and to care with His compassion. Here I am. Use me. All of me. Every moment of every day at every opportunity to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, for your glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Again, going back and asking the question, what's God's goal for us? I've asked that the last couple of weeks. What's His goal for us? Well, it's to live according to our kind. The reasons dogs bark and cats purr and giraffes have long necks and skunks smell so is because they're, they're living according to their kind. That's what they do. We have been given the Spirit of God, the DNA, the nature of God to live according to our kind, which is here His kind. And I remind you again of this in John 1. In the beginning was the Word... The Word was with God. The Word was 
God. The Word was Jesus. And since we're to be like Him, we need to realize that as we walk and talk and go about our daily routine, we become the Word too. That makes sense? As we walk and talk every day, we preach Christ. We do. And how many times have you heard this little phrase, you may be the only Bible somebody else is reading? So are they, are they getting the right version? Because we can listen to all kinds of TV evangelists and other people that tell you all kinds of stuff about what Jesus says is okay these days. There's a lot of false gospels out there. Just ask this question. What's the purpose of words? Why do we use words? To communicate. Uh, it's in purple. <laughs> no brainer. The purpose of words is to communicate. Jesus is the Word. He's God in the flesh. He came in the flesh to communicate with us what God was like. Mm -hmm. He told the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, show us the Father. Okay. Ta-da! <laughs> and if we're to be like Him, we also are to communicate what the Father's like, what the Son is like. We are in essence to be the messages of the Lord to communicate. We send snail mail, we send emails, we send text. Back visiting with Lyle and Randy and, and uh, Lou earlier, and I got a text. And I had to excuse myself. I'm like, what is this? This is from the uh, uh, rehab place where my mom is. Why are they sending me a text on Sunday morning? What's going on? Well, it's just to let me know. Uh, today's Sunday, tomorrow's a holiday, uh, your mom's doing so good, we're going to let her go Tuesday. So I'm like, cool. Mm -hmm. That means I've got to hurry up and get a couple things done before she gets out. Well, we send texts, emails, whatever. We are God's uh, means of communication. Mm -hmm. Whether you want to consider yourself snail mail or a quick text or an email, Ding. You have mail. We do that in our daily attitudes and actions. So it's imperative that we live according to our kind. So here's another question. How are we doing at this? Self-examination time. How are we doing at communicating Jesus with others? As they read us, are they getting first class mail or junk mail? Are we trying to send a personal, private message? Or are we just, well, to occupant? <laughs> if you catch anything on the way, praise the Lord. <laughs> are we really trying to be specific as we minister and relate with somebody else? Guys, we are supposed to be God's first class male in the midst of a very, very impersonal world. Here I am, send me, and I, I shared with you guys last week the coolest thing that Nikki got to experience. Mm -hmm. She was asking me, how do I share, how, how do I share a testimony with somebody else? And I, and I pretty much said, baby, if you'll just go, God will do the speaking. Okay. You don't have to learn mm -hmm. a line. You don't have to memorize half the New Testament. Just, mm -hmm. just show up. You have His Spirit inside of you. you, right? You got that? Yeah? Okay. So His Spirit is in you. Just, just show up. Be a tool in His toolbox. He'll use you. That's what it's like to walk in the Spirit instead of the flesh. Yeah. And, and when she had that opportunity, she said, Man, some stuff came out. And I'm like, wow. That was good. And she talked some more, and he asked questions, and they talked some more. And, and she, was, she was ready to go on the hunt. She was looking for more. Oh, fresh meat. Oh, you know, Jesus. 
Let me, let me give you an idea, and I know you know this, but this is where we are today in 2020. We have moved from similarity to diversity. We've moved from familiarity to being strangers. We build fences, we close curtains, we lock doors. We work with machines and instruments and computers and robots and voice mailings instead of interacting with people. We shop online rather than in person. And we now have automatic scanners that tell us the price, take our money, and give us our change. We don't even have the friendly talking coke machines from the 80s. Do you remember those? You may want to go Google that if you have What? Yeah, back in the 80s, the coke machine would talk to you, so you felt like you had something going on. Who needs a co-pilot anymore? GPS is a standard feature on a lot of vehicles. Why am I saying all this? Basically because of this. Church, I believe that as things continue to progress as they are, or maybe I should say digress, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, boy, that came out weird, didn't it? Mm. That's supposed to say the place. Instead of the plaque. <laughs> Just know that in the future, the church is going to be the plaque. <laughs> it's going to be the place for people to come and be able to have a personal relationship. Because so much of our world is getting away from that. It's either going to be the church or the bar. Yeah. And I don't understand the idea, but behind happy hour because I have gone in before to get a soda somewhere and seen people in there crying and moping and thinking, well, if this is happy hour, yeah. I don't want to be in here when you guys are sad. <laughs> the church is going to be the place for people to connect. Mm -hmm. People need the Lord. They need to know that they matter to God. They need to know that they matter to us here. Would you agree? And in Scripture, we can read in John 3, Jesus had an encounter with a religious leader, a Pharisee, a guy named Nicodemus, part of the Jewish ruling council. The next chapter, he encounters the woman of the well, a woman who is shunned by everybody else because she's been married so many times. But Jesus had a heart big enough to reach both extremes. And if that's how Jesus loves, we need to love like that too. Maybe some of us do need to slip into a bar and get a cherry coke just to be able to witness to somebody else mm -hmm. and see somebody that's really having a really bad day and instead of pointing that out to them because they already know Rick you should say I want to pray for you mm -hmm. and just go ahead and slip them a little church card mm -hmm. I think our churches need to have wider doors for more broken people instead of the attitude of get it right you can commit mm -hmm. that we see it so many places well let's wrap this up one more passage of scripture from Luke chapter 6 Jesus says to you that are listening I say love your enemies and do good to those who hate you Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If somebody takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks of you. If anyone takes what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. For if you love those who love you, what credit's that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Are you thinking, you know, I wish he hadn't said some of this stuff. Well, he's not through. It goes on. If you do good to those that are good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do that. If you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? For even lenders, even excuse me, even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. 
lend to them without expecting to get anything back, and then your reward will be great. You will be children of the Most High because He's kind, even to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, then, as your Father is merciful. The church, God's love has got to break down all the fences and all the barriers. And I believe perhaps what grieves the Spirit and hurts our Father's heart the most is the ways in which we sometimes treat each other. And I can say this for sure. In some of the churches where I've been and stories that I've heard from others, some of the meanest and most hateful people are the ones that are sitting in church pews ever since. And that's, I just know that breaks the Father's heart. But I'm not here to talk about them. I'm here to talk about me and each one of us here this morning. How we doing in the love department? How we doing in our love for God and our love for our fellow man? Again, we've been created and recreated to live according to our kind, which is His kind. God predetermined that this was going to happen. He's given us His DNA so that we can do it. He expects us to grow and mature and become more and more like the Lord Jesus in our attitudes, our thoughts, and our actions. And He expects us to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is the fruit that's really going to last. Jesus said all the law, all the prophets are summed up very simply. Love God. Love others. How are we doing on that? Let's pray. Father, we will be uh, we will be humble as we come into your presence and admit to you that we're not doing so good sometimes. Even in trying to love you with everything we've got, we get so selfish and so greedy and so egotistical and we we try to turn away from the leading of your spirit saying, I don't want to do that right now. I want to, I want to do what I want to do. But we go off in secret sin or we sit on pity porch and we huff and puff and fume about something because something didn't go our way and we fail to realize that you're trying to teach us something through a lesson. Or that you have a reason and a purpose for something that's going on in our life. Instead of trying to ask what we need to learn through it, we just cry and whine and say, why me, Lord? We want to love you better. We want to love you more. And Father, when it comes to loving others oh, we're so good and so quick to pick and choose who we think is worthy of our love or attention forgive us please God forgive us again I praise you and thank you for your patience with us Holy Spirit please continue to work on us bombard us with scripture Hold the Lord Jesus up in front of us all the time. and Father, find us faithful. Striving to be more and more like Him. For this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.